Yeah, so as the theme's all about love today, I just want to share a thought or two with you. So our faith, our belief in God, is built on a number of foundation stones. Hope, joy, grace, peace, truth. And over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at some of these building blocks. What the Bible describes as fruits of the Spirit. And Jesus told us in the greatest of, that the greatest of these is love. And what a great place to start today. So I'm going to invite the lovely Michelle to come up and share with us. Hello. For them that don't know, yeah, know me, I am Harry's wife and I am as nervous as anybody else in this building. I don't normally do this, but it goes. This is a story of God's love on my life. First of all, I was born into a big family. I was one of seven and I was the sixth one. So God already knew that I needed other people around me. I don't like to be on my own and I don't like to go into an empty house or an empty building. I love to be with other people. So God already knew that and gave me brothers and sisters. Um, I grew up in a loving family and my father was the one that was the Christian in the family. He was the one that took other children to Sunday school and to church. And he was a loving father. And that is why I am able to connect with my father in heaven because I had a loving father on earth. So right from day one, I knew of God's love. Um, at the age of 14, I had a bit of disaster in my life, which is personal to me. I never thought that I would find somebody who would love me unconditionally, who would love me through what I'd been through. And um, at the age of 16, I met Harry, and God put Harry into my life because he knew he was a patient, kind, and loving man. He wasn't a Christian, but he believed in God. Um, and so I prayed for him for years and years and years. Um, we got married. I was 20, so we'd courted for four years. Um, we, ne we both didn't care for children, and... We didn't want children, but my two elder sisters never had their own natural birth children. They adopted, uh, but they never had their own children. And so, in one mad moment, I prayed, God, if you give me a child, I will love it unconditionally. And that is when we received Debbie, our daughter. Now, Debbie was from day one, a very, very trying child. She is now 39 and still is a very trying child. <laughs> but she gave us three beautiful, beautiful grandchildren, of which one was married, born out of wedlock, and that's Justine, which you'll know uh, very well. And Justine has been a rock to me because Three months after Justine was born, my father died. And so, even though I've had disasters, God has given me something to hold on to uh, and to show his love for me. And Justine was that person. Um, and Justine is now having a baby herself in March, and I hope she finds the love that I found when she was born. Um, then... We, uh, we I I'm, I'm feel that I have always had upsets in my life, disasters, things have gone wrong. But out of that, I've come love. And, and that's God's love. Because from Justine being born, Harry came to faith. It was going to the church where we was to baptize Justine. Um, he found that he'd come home and he found God's love. And um, that is my life. And I've always found if you pray to God, he might not, the answers might not be what you want, 
and you still will have a lot of upsets, but God is always there, ready to put his arms around you, and you have to wait for the bigger picture to see his love. As you know, Michelle doesn't speak out loud and she doesn't do hugs, but I'm going to give her one from all of you. The quieter of you of your two church wardens, the more withdrawn and less confident one is John. He, <laughs> <laughs> he describes himself as a, a very down-to-earth, northern working man. And I'm sure you won't mind me saying that he's a bit of a rough diamond. But every diamond has many facets, and there's a side to John that we don't often see. But he sent this message of love for you today. So just watch this and think of John in another light. Morning. I can't be here today um, as I've got to work. My secular job, I know I'm working on the Sundays, but I'd much rather be here. However, Harris said I could do a video for you all. So here it is. Most of you know me, and most of you know that I apply my trade as a security guard over in deepest, darkest Huddersfield. But I'm really fortunate as a security guard that I get to walk around the factory grounds. And as I'm walking around the factory grounds, I get to think about my faith. I get to think about God. I get to pray to God. So in a way, I'm actually getting paid as a security guard to think about God, which I think is really cool. So anyway, in the summer months, when the weather was really nice, and we had quite a decent summer, I was thinking, and God tipped up and said, John, how are you? He says, Father, I'm really well, how are you? He says, I'm really good. What are you thinking about, John? Looking rather puzzled. He says, well, I'm thinking about the greatest commandment. He said, oh, the greatest commandment, that's a good one. I like that one. He says, yeah, it's pretty cool. He says, you know, you can actually condense those two paragraphs, those two statements, into five words. As most of you know me, you know I'm not the sharpest tool in the box. So I kind of looked a bit puzzled. And my, ears started to go a bit, and my eyes started to go a bit gauzy. God said, I'll start you off. Love God. Love God. Love your neighbour. I went, there you go, you've got it. I said, love God, love your neighbour. That is really, really cool. He says, yeah, there you go. Now go away and have a think about it and see what it means to you. So I went away and I spent a couple of weeks thinking about it. So I'm walking around the factory grounds again. And God turns up again and says, hey, up, John, how are you? Father, I'm really well. How are you? He says, yeah, I'm good. Have you been thinking about the greatest commandment? Love God, love your neighbour. I said, I have. I said, you're nudging now after reading it. I think I can get it down to one word. And he said, what one word is that, John? I said, love. And he says, there you go. So I don't care what they say about you at St. James. I know you're not as thick as they make out. I said, so it's right. Just one word, love. And he went, yeah. Go away and have a think, John. See what the word love means to you. And see how you can apply it to others. He says, right, yeah, okay, I will. But here's the thing. I suffer on occasion from misanthropy. I look at God's creation. I look at this fantastic creation of his. The creation that he has created. And I get really downbeat on the human race. I see how we're destroying the world. Everything we touch, we seem to destroy. We overfish, we overfarm, we defrost rising at an alarming rate. I also look at how we treat each other. We are so ingenious at coming up with ways to harm, hurt and kill one another. And it really beats me up, does this. And I often think the way to solve all these problems is actually to get rid of the human race. Hence, I suffer from misanthropy on occasion. 
When I stand outside those doors of church and I look across towards Queensbury and Clayton and I think, what a beautiful place this is. How could we ever do this to our planet? And how could we ever abuse and mistreat each other? But as a Christian, my whole life has to come down to Scripture. And the whole of Scripture, for me, has to come down to the greatest commandment. That solar Scripture. It's one of the five solars. If you don't know what the five solars are, you can ask, go away, do your homework up, and look it up for yourselves. Or ask Harry, because Harry's pretty knowledgeable. So as a Christian, my whole life comes down to the two greatest commandments. It's a brilliant concept, is this, love God, love your neighbour, love. It's incredibly simple, but when you start to think about it, it is incredibly complicated. But if it's good enough for God, then it's got to be good enough for me. I am one of his creation. And here's the thing. This is the absolute nub of it. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. God so loved the world. And love is worth dying for, as witnessed on the cross. This is God's love in theory and in action. God allowed his son, Jesus Christ, to come to earth to save us through love but then he let his creation, his creation, crucify him on the cross. This sounds really, really bad. But out of this crucifixion came this amazing act of love in that we are saved. I am saved. And if God can go out of his way to love me enough to sacrifice himself, this wretched sinner then I have to love everything. Paul speaks about it really eloquently in Corinthians. Sure you all know that chapter. He waxes lyrical about the beauties of love. And like I say, it is a fantastic thing, it's love. It is the greatest miracle, the greatest gift that we have ever been given. Every time when I start to get beat up on the world, every time I start to get beat up on the human race, I'm nudged by God. And I'll say, John, the greatest commandment. And I come back to it, to love. And I will cast my eyes heaven and I'll say, but look at what we're doing to each other. Look at what we're doing to your creation. And I'll say, yes, John, but love's worth dying for. And I died for you. Your duty, your essence is to love Right from the start, humans have pondered the big question of why am I here? What is the meaning of life? The meaning of life for me is to love. It's that simple, but yet it's that complicated and it's that hard all at the same time. It's a real conundrum. How do I love when I don't like the human race? It takes practice and it's hard work. And there are some in this church who are much, much better than me. I admit sometimes of the church warden and people come up to you and start complaining, I think. Very little love going on here at the moment. However, when I think about Christ, uh, when I think about Christ's sacrifice on the cross, I think if Christ could do that for me, then I have to do that for others. I have to love. You could take all the pages out of the Bible. And you have one page in there. So when you open up the cover, the cover would say, uh, the page would say, love. Love one another as I have loved you. Not as we have loved each other, but as God has loved us. So like I said, love is worth dying for. If God can die for love, then surely we can love all things. I think that's pretty much it. Love's an amazing thing. And it is worth dying for. And it is worth loving everything. Because love looks, overlooks all transgressions. It looks over all hatred and all anger. It soothes pain. It embraces those who are outcasts. 
It brings us all in. Because love is all encompassing. It's an amazing thing when you think about it. And I'm just thankful that I've got God to let me think about these things. Otherwise, I would just go around hating everybody and hating everything. But when I sit down, I think about the greatest commandment. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love. And I start to think about it, and I think, yeah, love actually really is so very, very cool. And I want to be a part of this. So as you go about your week now, as you leave this church, I want you to think about what love means to you. Can you love others that you don't love? Is there a relationship that needs repairing? Then repair it through love. Yes, you'll have to compromise. Yes, you'll have to give concessions. Yes, you'll have to give ground. But it's much better to love than to hate. It's easy to hate, but much harder to love. But it's so infinitely rewarding. Our Creator says so. And like I said earlier, if it's good enough for God, good enough for me. Who am I to argue with my Creator? I'll leave it there. Peace be with you. Have a good week. Go love somebody. We are often told, God loves you. But what does that really mean? That some impersonal force, galaxies away, may consider you from time to time? Or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity and God cares for all of it? There are billions of lives, billions of stories. Can we really believe he has great destinies planned for all of them? Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is his perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are his child, created in his image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, he's carefully constructing the events of your life to build his kingdom. If you are willing, he can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you. You know, it's really good to hear different interpretations of what love is, not only to us personally, but what God says about love and how we should show that love to each other. So now we have the lovely Jane, who's going to come and share with us. Well, that's an hard act to follow, isn't it, right? Well and truly. No wonder I needed a holiday to get myself ready for this. Um, God's love is so different to ours, isn't it? I was reading in 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, Love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, and it's not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. I struggle to do that with myself, let alone with rest of the world. <laughs> rest of the world. But that might be just me, but God's love just rides over all that. No matter what I do wrong, and I tend to get it wrong pretty often, really. Um, and bluff my way through life, but it's, it's always there. And I know that I can always hang on to him. And I know, not to Michelle's extreme, but I have had upset, um, things that have not gone according to plan in life, you know, especially 
John and I met, fell in love, and like Harry and Michelle, you plan all these lovely things. And we did plan a family, and it didn't work. But one scripture through, um, through both planning my family and what eventually happened through the years, um, beautiful granddaughter coming into the world and the loss of my loved ones, none of it was planned, unfortunately. Um, but it got me from A to B. But the thing that got me from A to B and that I always, always cling on to is Psalm um, 139.15. And it simply says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your I saw my unformed body. All the days of, for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And I know that life does throw curveballs and no doubt it throws curveballs to the, the people that kindly then handed their child to me. But I know God were in that plan. And I just find that that is absolutely amazing. Um, and like I say, I know my loved ones went not according to our plans and one of them especially not according to the rule book, shall we say, of life. But I know God accepted him and I know that God loved him. And no matter what goes on in life and what curveballs we are going to be thrown, the one thing we can hang on to is God and God's love. And that is unconditional at all times and in all places.